Okay, well, our text this evening is simply one example of the many examples we have in Scripture where Jesus is characterized as uh, the one who is full of compassion. So let me read that for you from Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. Matthew writes, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our edification this evening. Now, again, just quickly, we have been seeing that Christianity is a religion of love. I hope we're convinced of that by this time. It's, it, it certainly is doom and gloom for those outside of Christ, but for those who are the Lord's, it's all about love, love towards God, love towards our neighbor, love towards one another. The love that the Father and Son share among themselves has been put in our hearts by Christ so that we might love as He loved one another and, of course, the Father. Now, again, that's what the Spirit's ministry is meant to produce in our lives. That's what we saw in the lives of David and Paul and, not surprisingly, in the life of our Lord Jesus. We saw this morning that Jesus the one whose image we are predestined to share, whom the Father gave as our great example that his life was full of love, first toward the Father. Now again, he did more than just simply say, I love you, Father, but he showed his Father that he loved him. And again, we saw his faithfulness in worshiping him, his constancy in fellowship with him in prayer, his being jealous for his glory and defending the honor of his father, doing exactly what it is that his father commanded him to do at all times and in all places, joyfully and not grudgingly, even when it came to that ultimate stoop to become a man and then offering himself on the cross. He did that in order that, that he might re, uh, really pre repair his father's justice offer the payment that was necessary for him to be able to extend his mercy and grace to us. Now, Jesus said this is the way that he would show the world his love for his Father. Now, this evening, I want us to consider the other aspect of Jesus' love, and that is his love towards his neighbor. Now, we know the greatest commandment in the law is to love the Lord with all the heart, mind, soul, and strength and we saw that Jesus did this. But Jesus also kept the second greatest commandment. He loved his neighbor as himself. Now, we know he did this by keeping the commandments. He honored his parents okay, and, he, and all authority. He never injured anyone or took a life. He kept himself and others morally pure. He never took anything that didn't belong to him, uh, though everything did belong to him. He never told untruths about anyone, nor did he covet what others had. Now, that is the definition of love according to the commandments, but we know there's more to it than just simply that. We know there is also the heart behind it. And, you know, we, we see this, I think primarily we could probably relate it to the sixth commandment, you know, you shall not murder, which is a commandment not only you know, not to take away life unjustly, but also not to, to hurt our neighbor, and more than that, to defend them, to protect them, uh, to reclaim them, to heal them, to help them, uh, and particularly to help them in their greatest danger, which is um, that of eternal damnation to which all men are liable. Our Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled that by being full of compassion, and showing mercy to everyone around him. And this is the facet of his love that I want us to focus on this evening. Jesus is full of compassion. Now, that's what we saw in our passage. Let me just read it again because I do want to make a couple of points here. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, 
teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Now, again, I want us to focus in on this word compassion because it is often used to characterize Jesus. Now, compassion is, is a word that is, um, actually means the same thing as sympathy. They just come from different roots, you know, compassion from Latin and sympathy from Greek, but they both mean the same thing, and it means this, to suffer with. It means to identify with someone in their need, to feel something of the pain that they're going through. Now, again, that's how love expresses itself. It's one of the main ways in which love, care, and concern for others is experienced, at least when it comes to those who are in need. And that's usually how love is expressed toward those who are in need. When the Good Samaritan saw the Jewish man who had been beaten and left on the side of the road to die, he felt compassion. What does that mean? It means that he could see himself in that man's position. He could think about what that man must be going through and being moved by that man's plight, by that compassion. He reached out to do something about it. Now remember, Jesus spoke the parable of the Good Samaritan in answer to the lawyer's question. Who is my neighbor? The answer was, everyone near is your neighbor, particularly those who need you. Now, the author to the Hebrews tells us that one of the main reasons for the incarnation, not the only reason, but one of the reasons, was that Jesus might draw near to us to experience what we experience, that he might know what it is that we have to go through so that he could be not just a high priest, but a sympathetic high priest. Remember what the author to the Hebrews says about the importance of a priest being a man and, and not an angel, right? He says, for every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself also is beset with weakness. So we have a priest that is like us, in this case, the, the, uh, the high priest, so that he can be sympathetic, so he can empathize, sympathize, have compassion on us and bring us before the Lord in his work of mediating before the Lord on our behalf. Now, that is the reason the author to the Hebrews tells us in chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, that Jesus became a man. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. He also says in chapter 4, verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Jesus became a man so that he might be able to sympathize with what it is we're going through. And the fact that he can is the reason why the author to the Hebrews also encourages us to come to him knowing that he will help us. He says in verse 16 of chapter 4, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus knows what we're going through. Jesus is full of compassion. Now, we see that in his ministry. Okay? We see him going through the cities and the villages in Galilee, seeing the people as they are worried and dejected, sensing and, and feeling, as it were, their sufferings and that compassion within him. 
compelled him to do something about it. We read in our passage, he relieved their suffering by healing their sicknesses, and he preached the good news to them, the gospel. Now, Jesus in this passage also told his disciples to pray uh, that the Father would raise up more uh, compassionate workers and send them into the harvest because the harvest was great and the laborers few. There were not enough to reach all the people who were in need. Again, we see his compassion. Jesus healed the sick. He fed the hungry. He showed mercy to everyone in need. We have an example of him showing a particular mercy uh, to a destitute widow uh, from the city of Nain. We read in, in Luke's gospel, in Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 15. He went to a city called Nain, and his disciples were going along with him, accompanied by a large crowd. Now as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a sizable crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, do not weep. And he came up and touched the coffin and the bearers came to a halt. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. The dead man sat up and began to speak and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Now, think about this. This woman's life had been emptied out, kind of like Ruth's, you know, when she went to Moab and she lost her, well, she, she gained two daughters-in-law, but then she lost her husband and two sons, and then one of the daughters-in-law left, and, and she said, call me Mara. You know, my life has been bitter. The Lord has basically emptied me out. Well, this, this woman has become like that. Her life had become emptied. She lost her husband. She lost her only son. She was now alone and destitute. She had no one to care for her, and Jesus saw her and saw that need, and in his compassion in his, again, just suffering through her suffering, reached out to meet that need by giving her son back to her. Now, again, we know that Jesus did these miracles of healing. He did these miracles of raising the dead to show who he was, to prove whom he was, and that is, of course, the Messiah. But there were, notice, miracles of mercy because of his compassion for his people, his compassion for mankind, even his compassion toward the Gentiles we see on occasion through uh, Scripture. Now, that was just his compassion on those who didn't necessarily believe on him. He, ex he particularly extended this compassion toward his own, considering that moving account of where Lazarus passes away and Jesus goes to comfort Martha and Mary. After he had first of all talked to Martha, and Martha said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then Mary comes out to meet him, and we read that Jesus saw her weeping. And the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled and said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, see how he loved him. You know, it is true that there are those who read this, this um, particular account and they say that the reason why Jesus wept is because of their unbelief. Um, Jesus had done so much for them, they had seen so much, and yet they still didn't believe. But yet, we have to think about this for a minute because Jesus hadn't given them any particular promise that Lazarus was going to be raised again from the dead. And also, when Jesus is confronted with unbelief, it's usually a different response than weeping. You know, it's usually a bit of a reproof, a rebuke towards those who don't know him, but encouragement to those who do that they should trust and they should believe. I think it's far more likely that he was weeping because of their suffering. Jesus saw Martha and Mary so grieved because of the loss of their brother. He saw the Jews who also cared about their loss also weeping and feeling their pain, okay, being filled with compassion, he was moved to tears. And it's interesting that he still felt this, this, this pain and this suffering, even though he knew he was going to turn it all around and he was going to turn it back into joy because he was going to raise Lazarus again, he still wept because, again, of what, uh, the pain that they were experiencing. Now, 
it's interesting that um, that his love is is not only expressed, of course, in compassion, but it's also, and I, I should say, his love uh, towards his father and towards um, uh, his neighbor. Sometimes can be expressed in anger towards those who had no compassion. <laughs> you know, it's um, we read in, in Mark three of one example of, of those who are just the opposite of what it is that Jesus desires us to be, just the opposite of what, it, what He is. Uh, in Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, He entered again into a synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was withered. They were watching Him to see if He would heal Him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse Him. He said to the man with the withered hand, get up and come forward. And he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. After looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. So here, the lack of compassion, the heart, he, was, he was angry, grieved at their hardness of heart, the fact that they had no compassion upon this man in need, and of course, the fact that he knew how they would respond after he healed him. But even though their lack of sympathy would soon lead to their judgment, remember, it's their hard-heartedness in rejecting him, rejecting him as, as the Christ, rejecting God's plan for their lives, even after that, Jesus again felt compassion for them, thinking about what they would have to go through when that judgment finally came. And again, it would be a just judgment, but Jesus did not rejoice in it. Listen to what we read in Luke 13, verses 34 through 35. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who, who uh, sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not have it. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. And I say to you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then we see later in Luke's gospel that when he was approaching Jerusalem and he saw the city, that he wept over it saying, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and they will level you to the ground and your children within you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation." So Jesus' love for uh, mankind made him angered at a lack of love for mankind, but even when judgment came on them for their lack of love, Jesus still felt compassion towards them. He did not, again, glory or rejoice in what was coming upon these people for their rejection of him. Now again, we see his compassion towards his disciples in the last, uh, at the Last Supper, we read in John 13, verse 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that His hour had come, that He would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved His own who were in the world, He loved them to the end. By the way, let me just mention that as I read about how Jesus, having compassion upon His disciples, knowing what they were about to go through, the promises that He makes to them, these are the same ones that He makes to us as we have to be in this world, and we're going from here to, to the heavenly kingdom. Think about how he, he, or the one who was about to suffer, how his thoughts were on what they would have to suffer, and how he might comfort them. So in other words, Jesus is looking at the cross, but his thoughts are on his disciples in more than one way. I mean, certainly his compassion was moving him to offer himself for them because that is how he's going to save them. But he was also thinking about what they were going to have to, to go through, and so he, he reaches out to comfort them. 
he assured them, first of all, that his love for them would continue even after his departure because the reason why he was leaving was that he might prepare a place for them. He says in chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus comforts them and says his love for them would not end, but will continue even after his death. He warned them about the difficulties that they must face before they would go to this heavenly place that he had prepared for them, that as the world had hated and persecuted him, so it would do to them. He told them these things in advance so that when they happened, they wouldn't be stumbled. Okay? He would die and they would grieve, but again their grief would be turned into joy when they saw him again. He wanted them to have peace through their trials. So he told them he would send them the comforter and he gave them the promise that he would overcome the world that threatened them. And then at the end of this time, he offers in their hearing perhaps the most heartfelt prayer that we have recorded in the Gospels where Jesus offers his high priestly prayer. Now again, think about the situation Jesus is the one about to suffer unimaginable pain and torment on the cross, and his thoughts and his heart is directed towards his disciples to prepare them for this. And then finally, we see his greatest act of love in his willingness to take his Father's wrath in their place and in our place. You know, it's interesting, there's only three times recorded in the Bible where Jesus wept. Okay, we, we, we really have seen the other two, right? When he saw the grief of Mary and Martha and the Jews over Lazarus, when he foresaw the destruction of Jerusalem and the hardships and the terrors that his people would have to endure during that time, but the third time was in the garden when he prayed before his crucifixion. We read in Hebrews 5 verse 7, and I believe here the author to the Hebrews is referring to that event. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was hurt because of his piety. Now, Jesus knew that if he didn't go to the cross for us, for his disciples, we would all perish. And so out of his great love and his compassion, he sought the Father earnestly for the strength to be able to do this with loud crying and with tears because of his earnest desire that he accomplish this work for his Father and for his people. Again, Jesus is full of compassion. Now, the point behind all of this, of course, is that we have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. We have been predestined to become conformed to his image. And so as a part of our Christian experience, we are to have the same compassion towards others and particularly towards each other. Remember, I, I mentioned this at the beginning. Jesus said to his disciples at the Last Supper in the upper room, along with all those other things, in chapter 15, verses 12 through 14, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. And what is Jesus commanding them to do? Well, certainly, you know, not just to go through the motions that he has gone through for them, but rather to enter into one another's difficulties and pains and sufferings and to reach out in mercy to do something about them, to become like him towards each other. This is really a large part of what sanctification is all about, putting on the character 
of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I think, again, particularly his compassion. Because we usually think about, again, um, love is, is not just, again, a feeling, but it's an action. But it's generally an action towards somebody in need. And in order to reach out to somebody in need, we have to sense something of the urgency of the need. We need to sense something of the need itself, the pain, to reach out to do something about it. So Paul writes this in Colossians 3, verses 12 through 13. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. You know, we talked about how love is, is the fountain of, of all the other graces that uh, are, we, we call the fruits of the Spirit. Here, Paul leads with this idea of a heart of compassion, almost as though it's the same thing as the love which the Spirit of God gives to us, that, that desire or that, that ability to be able to, to sympathize, to see the needs of others, and to respond to them accordingly in mercy with the right kind of attitude, the kind of attitude that our Lord Jesus would have with the kindness and the humility, the gentleness and the patience, the forbearance, the, for, the, the forgiveness, you know, the, the kind of love that Jesus showed us. Again, as we are enabled by God to do this, we are to reach out to meet those needs because we sense the need. Whether the needs are physical, providing food and covering, or spiritual, um, we see their, the, the fact that they need salvation, the salvation that God provides through the gospel. That's what Jesus did, okay? and that's what he calls us to do, and that's why he's given us the Holy Spirit, to give us the power to do it. But again, like every other thing in sanctification, there's something we have to do. As Paul already told us, we need to put these things on. We need to seek the Lord to develop this love within us so that we would sense this, this compassion, this um, the, well, sense the needs of others and, and be moved by it so that we reach out to do something uh, about it as the Lord gives us the ability. Well, um, let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask that the Lord might help us to do that.